Good morning. Good morning. So nice to be here with all of you this morning. My topic for today was one that I had the opportunity to present in a, a seminar that was dedicated to actually all three of these questions, the big questions of life. And I was specifically focusing on where we come from. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to reflect what Spiritism has to tell us. And a few days after I had been invited to speak at that event, I heard a conversation on the radio. And the individuals were talking about speaking to children about pregnancy and where babies come from. And someone said that usually when it comes to small children, they will first want to know how the baby gets out of there before ever wondering how it even got in there in the first place. And I thought, you know, that's kind of funny because I think that when it comes to the big questions of life, we approach them in the same way. And so we ask ourselves, what happens when this life is over? How do we get out or where do we go? And usually we'll ask that before wondering why we're here and much less how we got here. Sometimes I think this is just because we accept that we were created or somehow came into being and we really have no other way of understanding what that really means. And we can only interpret things within the realm of what we're familiar with. But at the same time, while there are always at any given time limits to what we are capable of understanding, there's usually quite a gap between what we are familiar with at the time and what we are able to understand. So when someone or something is able to explain things to us with information that is new to us and that we are able to understand, it can really change the way that we see life. And that's the kind of life-changing impact that Spiritism can have on us. But Spiritism also teaches us to see things in a holistic manner, so that in coming to understand more about any one of those three big questions, we are inevitably going to understand more about all of them. Now, this morning, as I mentioned, we're going to focus specifically on the question where we come from. We are going to focus primarily on the material from the chapter Spiritual Genesis in Allen Kardec's book called Genesis. And because we are going to address several concepts that fall within these principles of Spiritism, I'm going to keep them displayed here throughout the discussion and as we go along, we'll build on them. And we'll talk about what each of them means conceptually and what they mean to us in terms of their relevancy to our daily lives. Now to, go, to back up and ask the question about where we come from, we first have to know who we are. In the Spirit's book, we have, Alan Kardec mentions that we have an instinctive sense of the future life, and this comes from the knowledge our spirits had before beginning this lifetime. And this is the reason why so many of us instinctively reject the idea of annihilation. But even without this information from the Spirit's book, and even if we had only that intuitive sense, still reason would lead us to believe that if we exist in some way after the perishing of the physical body, then there's something in us that survives the death of the body. And what is then that something? Plus, we know that we think, we reason, we have feelings, we make choices, and we have will, and we are aware of our presence in relation to those around us. And so again, reason would lead us to believe that the cause 
or the source of all that has to be in something other than inert matter. Well, to this kind of logic and to the grand collection of our philosophical and religious teachings, which at their most basic level are in agreement with such thought, we add knowledge from Spiritism. And this knowledge from Spiritism is in agreement with these ideas, but it is based on the study of spirit phenomena and spirit communications. So let's look at what Spiritism has to tell us. In terms of who we are, we are incarnate human beings. We are presently living in material life in the material world known as Earth. And we do have an immortal soul. This soul is the source of our intelligence, of all of our thoughts, and it represents our individuality that we forever maintain from the moment our spirits are created. The soul is always accompanied by a semi-material body or a body formed of a matter that is just less dense than matter as we typically know it, and we call this the perispirit. The perispirit has many functions that we study in spiritism, but this is the physical form that others, or that maybe some of us even, per perceive if we see spirits. And of course we have the physical body that we're all more than familiar with. Now the perispirit acts as an intermediary between the soul and the physical body so that it allows the soul to act or direct its will on the physical body and when external impressions are made on the physical body it allows the soul to register them. Now having established that as our baseline we can ask where these high-level components of our being come from. Well, Spiritism teaches us that there are two basic elements in the universe from which everything is derived by action of natural laws that operate under God's will. And one of those elements is spirit. Spirit represents the intelligent element in creation. And our human souls are what has become, in a way, an individualization of the spiritual principle. And so this is kind of a way to say where our souls come from. Now the non-intelligent element in creation is matter. Matter has numerous properties, many that we've already discovered and many yet to be known. Now although we find matter in a perhaps infinite variety of forms, all those forms are derived from a single most basic element that permeates throughout the entirety of universal space and we call that the universal cosmic fluid. Our perispirits and our physical bodies are formed from matter that is derived from this single basic element. But there are in nature forms of life that don't think like we do, right? So you might wonder where the vitality comes from in those life forms. Well, this vitality, similar to an energy circuit that runs through a battery, is something that in Spiritism we call the vital principle, which in itself is also a modified form of the universal cosmic fluid, or that basic form of matter. The vital principle is inherent to organic life, while the spiritual principle is inherent to intelligent life. And Alan Kardec discusses, or with this, the, the questions and answers from the spirits, he discusses the topic of the vital principle in the spirits book. But he brings it up in this chapter in Genesis in order to make it clear that the vital principle and the spiritual principle are two different things. And he gives an example 
when he comments that the independence between the vital and, sp and spiritual principles are what allow our bodies to continue functioning in organic life during our times of sleep while our spirits become liberated and engage in activities elsewhere in the spiritual realm. But in all of this, the important takeaway is the broader independence between spirit and matter, which is very important to us. Because the fact that we have an immortal existence, independent from matter, including our physical bodies, is at the foundation of understanding our existence. Now, in addressing the question of what happens to us when this life is over, this spiritual existence means that although our physical bodies will perish, we, as individual beings, go on living. And so, the knowledge and the virtues that we acquire are never lost. And the efforts that we make to overcome our struggles are not wasted. The bonds of affection that we form with one another are not destroyed with the perishing of the physical body. Although we may sense this continuity of life intuitively, as I mentioned before, and although we find teachings about the soul's survival in our many philosophies and religions, we can still, with them, fall into doubt. So Spiritism reinforces our belief in those ideas, making them palpable through experimental evidence. And on top of that, the more detailed set of moral and philosophical principles that we find in Spiritism, all of which are derived from a combination of observance and reasoning and revelation, they offer us a concrete way to understand and to find meaning in the otherwise unexplicable, perhaps, aspects of life. And it is in this that we find the motivation to continue seeking self-improvement and to endure all of the challenges that we face in this crazy life. But our spiritual existence, independent of matter, does not just address our concerns about what happens when this life is over or what it means while we're here. It is also very relevant to the question of where we come from. So in that regard, like the child's often secondary question of how that baby got in there, we can ask how we got here. And let's begin by talking about it in terms of the physical process by which a spirit begins a new incarnation and acquires a physical body. And then we'll kind of zoom out to talk about why we ended up here in this specific material world that we call Earth. So let me first ask a question. In the process that we call death, does the spirit, does the physical body die because the spirit leaves it? No. In fact, the spirit leaves the body because upon the eventual failure or exhaustion of the bodily organs, organic life, as we mentioned earlier, can no longer be sustained. So that vital principle withdraws and then the spirit can be free. At that point, what, for the spirit to be freed, the ties between spirit and matter are undone. Well, the opposite happens at the start of a new incarnation. As the body is formed, the spirit becomes united to matter, and this takes place through a process. So I would like to share with you a direct quote from Allan Kardec on how that works. He says, 
When the spirit must incarnate in a human body that is about to be formed, a fluidic tie, which is nothing but an extension of its perispirit, connects it to the zygote to which it is attracted by an irresistible force from the moment of conception. As the fetus develops, the tie tightens. Under the influence of the fetus's vital material principle, the perispirit, which possesses certain properties of matter, is united molecule by molecule to the body that is forming, a fact from which one may deduce that the spirit, through the intermediary of its perispirit, in a way takes root in the fetus, much as a plant takes root in the soil. When the fetus is fully developed, the union is complete and the being is born to external life. So this explanation gives us an idea of how that physical process begins and takes place. And it is quite fascinating to read in the spiritist literature about how the incarnating spirit, the spirit of the biological parents, and the mentoring spirits in the spiritual realm all take place and participate in all of that activity. But for the purpose of today's discussion, what I would like to really highlight is the fact that when a new child comes into this world, it is truly only the body that is new. The spirit of that child is a being that has already been in existence and in following its own evolutionary trajectory, it has a history of incarnations prior to this one. And because of that, the spirit of that child already has an acquired set of virtues and talents, developed at least to some degree, as well as certain inferior tendencies and weaknesses that it must work to overcome. The spirit has a memory, even if unconscious, of its past, and this will affect the way that it's going to see and approach life. There is a purpose for the spirit's incarnation, one that is part of a larger plan developed prior to the start of the actual incarnation and that somehow involves the child's parents and others that are going to be a part of its life. And chances are the spirit of that child and the spirit of its new family members are no strangers, spiritually speaking, because oftentimes they are individuals who have lived together in former lives. The spiritist, Irminio Miranda, made some interesting points in the opening chapters to his book entitled, Our Children, Our Spirits. And he talks about what he says we must unlearn if we are to incorporate all of this spiritual understanding in the way that we see and care for our children. And so he points out, for example, that Unlike our popular expressions, children do not inherit our personality traits, such as intelligence, artistic inclinations, good or bad taste, charm, sweetness, or aggressiveness. Instead, he says, each human being is unique in its psychological makeup, and only physical characteristics are genetically transmitted from the parents to the child, and these parents only produce the physical body, but not the soul. Similarly, he says, as parents and caregivers, we must understand that a baby has an adult intelligence and a mature spirit trapped, in a way, in a small, immature physical body that does not allow it to express itself fully. But this changes over time 
as the child grows and becomes an adult. And as you know, that's when we start to see personalities flourishing. In later chapters of the book, Erminio shares some details and stories that reveal an amazing awareness that the spirit of a small baby has about what is going on in its surroundings and it is so much more than we would ever imagine. Something else he says that we need to be aware of is that a child's spirit not only has to get used to this small new body, but it must go through a process of relearning as part of this new life. And so it must learn the language and customs of its new people, it must master new manual skills, and it has to adapt overall to the environment and relationships that are a part of this new life. And he advises parents, he says, you will have the privilege and responsibility of helping your child express itself again as a human being probably in a different field of activity. In fact, he says, you will always have a great responsibility towards your children, whether they are girls or boys, intellectually gifted or challenged with a learning disability, easygoing or aggressive, healthy or sickly, calm or rebellious. For some reason, he says, which you will one day understand, a child has been handed to you or attracted or invited by you to come to this world. And he comments, it will almost never be a total stranger whose paths have never crossed yours in the past. And don't forget that you yourself are a reborn spirit. So our material body is created through a physical process initiated by the child's parents. And the newly incarnating spirit transitions from life in the spiritual realm, where spirits actually spend most of their time, once they're created, to life in the material world. And, as Erminio commented, we are all reborn spirits. A new incarnation in reality is only one of many that have taken and that will take place through the process of reincarnation. So another way to answer the question of where we come from is to say that in a way as incarnate spirits living here in the material world, we come from the spirit world. So incarnation is a mechanism by which we temporarily give up life as free spirits and return to inhabit a material body. Reincarnation is simply the process by which we do this many, many times over the course of many centuries as we travel our own paths of intellectual and moral evolution. Kardec talks about the daily emigrations and immigrations that spirits make in, trans in transition between these two realms. Now I've shown this here this way for illustration purposes, but in reality the spiritual and material worlds do not exist in two distinct places, rather they coexist alongside one another. So this is at least a, a little more accurate on it two-dimensional surface, at least. Now, life in the material world offers us unique opportunities that facilitate our progress. So, for example, the constraints of our physical body require us to provide for our safety and well-being. And in this way, they motivate us to work and therefore to exercise and develop some important faculties. Due to the varying circumstances of our lives, from the conditions into which we are born, to the activities that we become involved in, the relationships that are a part of our lives, 
not to mention the capabilities and limitations of our own physical bodies, we will encounter in the material world all kinds of situations through which we will learn and grow as we exercise our free will and experience the outcome of the choices that we make along the way. But Allan Kardec stresses the clarification that an incarnation is not a form of punishment, it is simply a condition inherent to our unevolved spirits. And the good news is that in Kardec's words, as the spirit progresses, it as the spirit progresses morally, it dematerializes. That is, by freeing itself from the influence of matter, it purifies itself. Its life becomes more spiritualized and its abilities and perceptions broaden. And subsequently then, happiness is a result of the progress that any spirit has achieved for itself. Now this process may be delayed or prolonged, or it may be shortened, more direct, depending on how we use our free will. Even though a mere sense or conviction that there is life after death may inspire us in the choices that we make during this lifetime, when we have the knowledge to take a step back and see a bigger picture that shows us that in coming to live here on earth we came from life in the spirit world that we might have waited an extremely long time for this opportunity and that we have goals and objectives for this lifetime that were planned long before the day we were born then I think that such an understanding really deepens our appreciation for the gift that is this present lifetime that we are now living. But to broaden the picture even more, Spiritism teaches us that our planet Earth, including the material world itself and the spiritual realm that encompasses it, is not the only place that we find life. Because life also exists on the many other worlds found throughout creation. And these worlds, just like spirits, are themselves in a constant state of evolution. The creation of worlds is ongoing as well. And so uh, these worlds, again, just like spirits, are found at all different levels of progress. The physical and moral progress of any particular planet always accompanies the moral progress of its inhabitants. And so this is one way by which our individual progress contributes to the progress of the world that we are living in at any given time. That said, however, it's also the case that the spirits themselves do move from one world to another. These daily emigrations and immigrations that Kardec mentioned don't just occur between the spiritual and material realms. They also take place between worlds. And so, here we have another way to answer the question of where we come from. Because it's likely that before ever calling the spiritual and material realms of planet Earth home, we actually came here from the realms of some other world. One of the reasons why we are incarnating here is because this is a world that is compatible with our personal evolutionary state at this time. But this doesn't mean that we live just once on each world and that when a new opportunity for a, a new incarnation comes up, that we just jump on to the next one. As Kardec says, if we look around here on Earth, we will easily observe a broad spectrum of traits that characterize spirits at all different levels of progress. And this illustrates 
how just one planet like ours offers a vast field for our own progress. Just the contact alone between spirits more and less advanced offers or facil facilitates a great variety of learning opportunities. We can find examples and inspiration in those who are more developed than ourselves, just as we are able to live alongside of and hopefully help or serve in some way those less advanced and even those who we may have hurt in some way in the past. By returning multiple times to the same world, we also avoid the disruption of constant changes between vastly different environments. And we have the chance to finish or continue working on what we might have left unfinished in the past. And we have a better chance to really form and develop the spiritual ties between us. So there's good reasons for which we typically come back many times in the same world. But when a spirit has accomplished all the degrees of progress possible in one world, according to the state of evolution that that world is in at the time, the spirit will then leave to incarnate on a more advanced world. And in that more advanced world, one will find companionship among fellow souls who share in the same will to grow and to live in harmony. Knowledge of God and natural laws will also be not only more prevalent or more deeper, but also widespread. And these characteristics will be reflected in the ratio at which one will find the presence of good compared to the presence of malevolence or wrongdoing. The physical environment of the new world will also be more pleasant because it too will be more evolved and more refined. In the end, the more advanced a world is, the better life there will be. For happiness and love will be increasingly present and eventually increasingly predominant. And this point, by the way, meaning our ability to migrate between worlds, shows how our happiness and progress are truly in our own hands. Because we cannot even be held back by the less advanced progress of a world in which we had been living. And through Spiritism, we really learn that if we are willing to spread our wings and make the necessary efforts to fly, then we can soar as fast or as high as our own actions and choices will take us. But we need to be aware that laws like action and reaction and other natural laws, they work both ways. So we don't always transition to more advanced worlds. Sometimes we move in the opposite direction because if in our own rate of progress we do not keep up with the progress of the world in which we have been incarnating, or in other words, if we insist in exhibiting certain behaviors or persisting in a particular way of thinking that is not on par with the ethical development of our general spiritual community, then the time will come when we will no longer be able to incarnate on that world or any other world at the same level, at least until we have acquired the merit to do so. Instead, we will incarnate on less advanced worlds, a transition that becomes for the spirit a form of self-imposed suffering. Because life on the less advanced world is going to be less pleasant. It will be much less comfortable, more physically demanding. The material environment will be denser. In the spiritist body of knowledge, we find our answers. And as a result, our new understanding strengthens and energizes our faith. It gives us a renewed hope and purpose. And we find the inspiration to really make the best of this life 
with an understanding of our past and an eye on the future. I thank you all so much for your attention this morning. And I would like to open at this time for any questions and answers. If anyone has any comments.